Right, today I'm going to talk about kilns and I'm going to be throwing a bunch of trap mugs while I do it. Um, talk about kilns because a few people asked a few weeks ago, or well, it feels like a few weeks ago, a little while ago, and it seemed like a good idea and then I recorded a video and wasn't entirely happy with it so I didn't post it. And I wanted to go back and kind of almost script it and think about what I wanted to say so it's slightly more coherent and I haven't done that and I think I'm probably too busy at the moment to fit that into my list of things to do I keep thinking I'm going to and I'm running out of time so it's either I don't do it or I'm just going to ramble a bit so if I post this it's because I was happy with it in the end um, apologies for the rambling nature, but unfortunately uh, things are hectic because we're heading towards Christmas and probably only going to get more hectic. So firstly on the round travel mugs, this is 450 grams of clay for a large travel mug which will hold 450ml of uh, liquid when it's fully fired and I throw both, well all my sizes of travel mug, I only have one size of lid and I made myself this little notched guide just a, um, it's actually the stirrer for acrylic but it's basically a, a, an ice cream stick and I've cut two notches out so I can tell as long as the wall fits into those two notches it's the right size and I'm going to use the laser to make it a bit easier to keep track of where I am uh, and I'm just going to throw those while I do it. So firstly the thing with kilns is there are a couple of different kinds um, and they're basically the, the ones you get in ceramics are either electrical re resistance so just an electrical kiln uh, and they are unless they're heavily modified oxidation only which means you can't get some of the colours that you can get in reduction firings and you can get reduction in combustion firings which is um, you know gas wood and then salt and soda are I think they're usually gas but um, the salt and soda refer to things that you add to the kiln while firing to change the atmosphere, the chemical atmosphere within um, the kiln. So it actually vaporizes fluxes, which will then waft around the kiln and change, uh, and sort of create glazes with the clay and change the way things behave. I've never done them, um, that's what I understand of them. So they are, whereas the others, gas and wood, you're talking about what you're actually burning salt and soda you're talking about what you're adding to the kiln right that's pretty good so um, and i would say i mean not that i can talk about any of the others anyway because i haven't done any of them yet i'm looking at getting a gas kiln because i would like to be able to fire a reduction um, and fire bigger pieces uh, and the nice thing with gas is that it's easier if you're not in an industrial setting to go bigger because you just need more gas whereas with electricity you need the wiring that's capable of supporting a bigger kiln so that is one consideration with electric so Electric kilns aren't actually particularly amazing at heating. What they are amazing at is insulation. So uh, you, I've got a 60 litre kiln, which is on the smaller side of kilns in general, and definitely in the, on the smaller side for people that do this full time but actually it's quite a nice size if you're going to fire it often 
Um, my that 60 litre kiln comes in two options. One of them is a 13 amp plug into the mains in the UK. This is uh, America has slightly different power ratings, I know, and they have a lower voltage option, which wouldn't get this. But in the UK, so 230 volt, 13 amp plug, so the same as you'd use on anything else. You can just plug it into a normal plug socket in a normal house, assuming the house is wired correctly, not an ancient one, in which case you might blow the, the wiring because it's a very long duration of a load. But it, with the same power that an electric kettle has, um, that kiln will go up to 1200C, which is... Oh no, yeah, no, sorry, well, 1200 cone 6. I was thinking it was going a bit lower than that, but no, you can go to cone 6. I got the cone 10 version of it, but I've never fired that hot, which um, is about twice the power, so it's five and a half kilowatts rather than three kilowatts. But a three kilowatt kiln will plug into the mains in the UK um, just with a normal plug socket and if you get a smaller one you can fire to cone 10 off that and that is by virtue of the insulation not the power so it just puts heat into a box for many many hours and eventually because it's so well insulated you're talking white hot on the inside So what sort of size you want to go for as a beginner? I think 60 is quite a nice size. It allows you to do up to a decent size of kind of bars and bowl because you get a reasonable amount of height and width for that. And it doesn't take ages to fill. I could get Depending on the height of the mugs, I could probably get um, 12, about 30 decent sized mugs and maybe more like 40 if they were small in a single firing. And it will go from loading to unloading, so cold to cold basically with a cone 6 firing in under 24 hours so I can fire it every day if I wanted to um, and have been I kind of alternate bisque and glaze as and when I need to but um, it does get fired most days in the run up to Christmas um, if you have a bigger kiln then you can obviously fit a lot more in it's more efficient you can pack it more efficiently one thing that Mine is quite bad for is if the reason the mug sizes don't change too much is because I can get seven mugs on a shelf whether or not they're big, well medium to, to giant mugs will all fit pretty much the same and all that changes is the gap between them and that is because when you can only fit seven to a shelf and you've got to fit your um, the, the kiln furniture in so you can you've got your, your I don't actually know what they're called the kiln stands the the things you stand the, the kiln shelves on you've got to get them in as well you are somewhat limited in how you can tessellate them and actually you don't get much efficiency from small things whereas on a, a much larger kiln you can tessellate really efficiently um, so that is, if you're going to produce lots of stuff, there's several reasons to go for a bigger kiln. But um, one thing I really like is that I get quick turnarounds and also there's never too much work in there at one time. So if you've mixed up a batch of glaze and for whatever reason it's misbehaving, it's gone on too thick, it's gone on too thin, you know, something goes wrong with the firing, you don't have a month's worth of work in there, you've got a few days worth of work in there. So, all in all, if you're considering a kiln, something around 60 litres is good and it's quite easy to wire one in. Uh, most houses, I think, 
five and a half kilowatts is sort of the ballpark for kitchen cookers and things like that. So, so houses will be rated for that. If you go too much bigger, you're getting towards a sort of power level that older houses might, or or just houses in general, won't have. So you're you're talking about a slightly bigger undertaking to wire it in. Um, but you can you know, factor that into the cost. That's fine. But this comes back to gas, where you just buy bigger gas bottles. Uh, there are obviously downsides to firing with gas, like it's not as automatic, it's not as controlled. So with my kiln I kind of press go and that's that. With the gas kiln, as I understand it, they take a lot more watching. You've got to be there and paying attention all the time. And then something like a wood kiln sounds like a lot more work, but they tend to be uh, bigger events with more people. So you do it as a shift rather than trying to fire one yourself most of the time. Uh, so all of this is sort of coming around to the you're going to buy your first kiln, what do you need to know? Um, and what should you go for? Uh, I don't really have much in the way of recommendations. I've got a Pottery Craft Comet um, and they won't be available in most of the world, I don't think. The one that I'm going to get next uh, will be a scut, but I don't know, what, I'll look at the sizes. I think they do one It's about 75 litres, which from my point of view would be great because I don't need to change any of the wiring in the studio. It's slightly overrated for the Pottery Craft one, so that slots straight in. I was considering a bigger one again, but um, I think I would need to run beefier cables here. Uh, so the SCUT touchscreens look good to me, that's what I'm going to get next, but I haven't yet used one. So that's not a personal recommendation at this point, it's just I think they look really good. Um, and then there's really just a few tips to firings that um, I can think of. So, depending on what controller you've got, you'll have different options. A more modern controller will let you program segments in and will let you set the rate that it fires at. Uh, so you tell it you want it to go up at 100 degrees an hour for, well, between the temperature of this and that, and the kiln will do it for you. It's computer controlled, it monitors the power it's putting in and the change in temperature and adjusts accordingly. Um, older kilns will have a variety of other things. They might have, uh, they might give you a temperature readout and then you can toggle the power on and off. They might have a kiln sitter, which is a, an automatic manual physical breakup. So it, it turns itself off once it's fired to a certain amount of heat work. Um, using cones, it's a very clever idea, but it does somewhat limit the control you can have with it because it's just, you know, you set the power and watch it go. And then some kilns won't have any temperature monitoring device. They will just have on and off for the relays, the, for the coils. And all kilns, well, all, because of the way they handle the power, the coils are either on or off. They use a relay. Um, so it's a, a low power circuit that throws a much bigger switch, which is how they can have a small controller um, handling such a powerful kiln. So you've got relays, which is what they'll, they'll toggle on and off. So when your kiln's working, it will make a, a loud clocking noise, kind of 
and that's the relay throwing on and off. So they are noisy and then they don't... Um, I kind of... I thought they'd, the computer control ones, when I before I'd ever used one, I thought they might be able to control the power a bit better so it was smooth, but it, it is literally because of the, the, the physical limitations of a relay. It is all done with relays and it's, the power is either on or off and they just um, change how long it's on or off for in a given time. So generally kind of 30 seconds it will spend some time on, some time off. Um, it doesn't have, none of that changes how you interact with them but just uh, that's how they work. Um, yeah, so depending on which kiln you've got, you'll have different options available to you. But all of this is going to be said assuming you've got a computer controlled one. Um, my cone 6 firing schedule goes, it's very similar to John Britt's E2 cycle because that's what I started with. Um, and it basically goes 100 degrees an hour to just under 100 degrees and then hold there. I don't think that's part of his schedule. I'm not sure he talked about it at all. But all of my firing schedules have a hold at or around 100 degrees C. And I actually, I only change the temperature of the hold. Uh, I have it slightly lower on bisque. Not because I actually think it makes any difference, because uh, I accidentally fired a glaze firing to bisque temperature for the first time I've ever got the two mixed up fairly recently. So I thought what I'd do is I'd make it so that the hold was a different temperature. So at a glance I can tell which one the kiln is about to fire when it reaches the hold. But the reason you want to hold at around 100 degrees is generally called candling from, as I understand it, without that kind of refers more back to combustion kilns because you'd have like a, essentially a candle flame is that the work will never be fully dry all, well it can be depending on what sort of climate you're in but generally speaking the work will have some residual moisture in it especially if it's bisqueware and you don't want the work to get too hot um, while it's still evaporating. So the idea is you don't put damp things in the kiln generally. Um, some, If it's your own kiln you can get away with it if you candle them for long enough. But even if you put damp things in the kiln, and I have put things that are basically fresh clay in, so long as they're small and you're going to be candling for a bit, you do not want the kiln to be heating up much past 100 degrees with them still wet. So I have an hour hold at 100. Um, depending on how wet you think your work is, you can extend or shorten that. But I would highly recommend having at least something. Uh, or just a very slow ramp at the start. Don't go quickly up from cold um, just in case if your work's wet it's not going to do it any good for the water to be boiling off um, evaporating like that and it costs weight well, with a lot of kilns they'll tell you um, you could do a firing to 100 and then you can monitor how much energy they're using but it'll add pennies to hold at 100 for an hour because, as previously mentioned, they're insulated boxes, so holding at a temperature is quite easy. So the extra energy for holding at 100 for a bit is negligible, and it might well save you um, blowing up a piece. And if a piece blows up, it generally goes over everything nearby and sticks itself into the elements and so on. So really not worth blowing up a piece, especially for the sake of an hour and 10 p's worth of electricity. So my firing schedule goes 
from room temperature to 100, hold for an hour. Then I believe it is about 250C an hour up to what the kiln reads as 1100C. Um, I might type all these out in the comments with Fahrenheit conversions, but I can't do it in my head. It's never made sense to me. Um, yeah, so up to, you're basically aiming to get to about 100 degrees below peak, and that's when the rate becomes important. And once I've got to 1100, which is approximately, I don't quite go to 1200, but this is all kiln dependent because I don't know if my thermocouple is reading the same way your thermocouple will read. It's quite possible that 1200 on yours is actually 11, I go to 1170 at the moment. The relevant thing is what the cones read, and I'll get into that in a second. But um, yeah, so I go up to approximately 100 degrees below peak. That's the point at which things start melting. All your organic things have burnt off at this point. Um, so now you want to slow things down and go up. I go up 50 degrees an hour for the last little bit. It's about an hour and a half for mine because I'm going up to 1170. I mean, obviously, all to that um, to suit whatever your kiln needs to hit to um, drop the cone that you want the way you want. Um, and then I have a 10 minute hold at peak and then 100 degrees or 150 degrees an hour back down to 11.50 and then half an hour hold. Now, I'm not 100% certain that does anything. Certain glazes, if you've got a glaze that's crystallizing, if you've got a glaze that needs a bit of time to heal over, or potentially my runny glazes, um, they will still be fluid for most of that time, but they won't be getting as much heat work as they would with a longer hold at peak. So it is possible that it's doing something worthwhile, but I put it in right at the start. I like how my glazes are behaving um, and I haven't changed it. When I get my new kiln, I'll have to relearn all of this, so that's the point at which I'll experiment with it. Uh, that'll be next year, at some point. But until then, I keep it, because it probably helps the glazes look interesting. Um, you might want to add one, you might not. Uh, and that's it. So then the kiln just shuts off and it cools naturally, and I get the workout. Um, when it's cool enough that it won't burn me through a bit of cloth, but I don't wait till it's cold. It's a myth that um, crazing is caused by getting the pieces out while they're hot, uh, and that cooling slowly will prevent it. Cooling, it's a chemical fit issue, so the glaze is shrinking more than the clay is, which is down to the chemistry, and you can prove it quite easily by changing the chemistry and then that will change whether or not it crazes whereas changing how what temperature you pull the pieces out of the kiln won't so that's a myth uh, ceramic materials workshop Matt's done a great video on how you stop glazes from crazing and it's essentially you add more glass formers, which is your clay and your silica. <coughs> um, the downside to that is that if you've got a glaze that you like the look and behaviour of, adding more glass formers will change the way it looks and behaves. A better solution is to find a clay body that fits the glazes that you like, um, which is what I did. And that's how I discovered this clay. You can obviously adjust the chemistry of the glaze, but, um, but you might never get the glaze to look the way you want after you've done it. Right, so cones. Cones are, um, I've mentioned cones a few times 
as temperatures, what cones actually measure are heat work. And they are, by the way, that's all the travel marks I'm throwing. I'm now just doing miscellaneous other things. Um, they're a very clever concept. Cones are basically a glaze fired too cold. So uh, if you ground up a cone six cone and fired it to cone 10, uh, you could apply it to the outside of a piece and it would form a glossy glaze. And it's basically how they monitor how much heat the um, kiln has received is because they're just starting to get soft. And it's all down to the chemistry, again, Ceramic Materials Workshop. There's a great video on, I think this one's free, certainly in the lectures, on the chemistry of cones. And you can see what they did to get cones to work incrementally and why the temperatures are slightly weird. Like, you look at the, <coughs> the temperatures that Orton say that their cones represent and the jumps are irregular and not how you would design it if you were designing for the jumps and the reason for that is that they have each cone represents a specified step in chemistry um, rather than temperature so they are a glaze and they are a glaze with as you go up in temperature, increasing amounts of um, glass formers to flux, so they don't melt at the temperature. They, they're softening, but they're not melting fully at the temperature you fire them to. If you overfire one, you'll see it forms a, a glossy puddle, and that is because it is just a glaze that's been set into a physical cone shape. Um, unfortunately, my hands are a bit crabby to go and get one. But if you've seen them, they start off, the, the freestanding ones, start off like that, and then as they fire, they bend. Um, and that's how you can tell how much heat uh, the kiln got. And the, the really interesting thing with cones is, again, it's not temperature. It's, um, it's heat work. Because the two are very similar in a lot of ways, but not the same. So what you want to know is how melted your glaze has got. Um, bring some of that clay in. And you can melt a glaze two different ways. And that's by going hotter or by spending longer at, a, at nearly the same temperature. So that's where that last 100C comes into, is, comes into play is depending on the rate that you travel that up, Autumn will tell you your peak temperature needs to be different to hit cone six. So cone six is actually a range of temperatures depending on the rest of the firing conditions because it's measuring the overall amount of heat that um, the work got. So going hot but not as hot and staying there for a while is worth going significantly hotter and then back down quickly because the cumulative effect is the same. The resulting glazes would probably look different but um, the clay will be similarly vitrified assuming the heat distribution is even in the kiln and that's another reason you want to go slowly for the last bit is that um, it allows the heat to spread evenly through the kiln um, it's worth putting cones in periodically, even if you don't do it every firing, just to check that uh, your schedule is hitting the temperature you want. Um, it's all relative, you don't need to fire to exactly cone 6 or cone 10 or whatever, you can go a bit over, a bit under, glazes work over a range. People say this is a cone 6 glaze, it might well be a cone 5 or a cone 7 glaze and it'll work at cone 6 and you might find they work better or worse, slightly hotter or colder than, than said um, but yeah, you don't need to be too precise with that, what you want to be is reliable for your own 
records, your own consistency. So worth being consistent for you, but don't worry too much if you fired something to cone five and a half or six and a half. Um, if it looks good and it's behaving the way you want it, then it's probably fine. You don't need to be too hard up on that. Um, with regards to firing evenly, uh, part of that is down to distribution of work through kiln and you might find that your kiln has hot and cold spots. For me, the bottom shelf is about half a cone colder than the top. I don't have a downdraft extractor. Uh, mine extracts near the top, so there will be a thermal gradient. Some kilns deliberately um, go out of their way to try and reverse that or have bigger elements at the bottom or the, the, the several thermocouples to make sure the heat distribution is even. Um, all you need to know from the point of view of using a kiln is that distribution of work will change it slightly so it's best to have taller things at the bottom with more of a gap between the shelves down there as it allows them to warm up more if you do it with several low shelves at the bottom the bottom middle will struggle to come to temperature a bit more but um, they're generally pretty good electric kilns just because they are sealed boxes um, and you're talking about a lot of heat going in there over 10 hours or so so they generally if you don't go too quickly for the last 100c or so you'll get fairly even unless your kiln's old like mine and it's kind of leaky around the top and then it becomes a bit trickier to get even and how you pack the kiln will affect it um, but again if you just want to not pack too tight or loose or if you do do it consistently a lot of this is just if you want consistency you have to do these things consistently um, whatever it is you're doing just don't change it from time by like every firing and you'll start to to understand what effect each change makes if each time you load the kiln you do it in a completely different way and fire a different schedule you'll never kind of figure out what changes what so consistency um, and then slow for the last 100 C and that dwell at the start to make sure things are dry I think that's it really I mean it's not a huge amount you could talk for kilns talk on kilns for years and not cover everything I mean I've only done the most boring and consistent of firing so I've done earthenware and cone 6 electric and I have done raku and pit firing with it there again different subjects and I don't know them very well so with all these things if you want to research them more there'll be plenty of people who've written at length about them but if you're going to get a kiln and fire it yourself especially a modern one you don't need to be too afraid they have a lot of safety features built in and so long as it's kept in good condition it should fail in a very boring way rather than burn your house down but obviously you they can burn your house down so treat them with a degree of respect and just when you find a setup that works for you don't worry if it's not what works for other people so I'm firing to cone five and a half and that is a lower temperature than even autumn says that it should be and that probably just means my kilns misreading but it works it works reliably 
Um, genuinely can't think of anything else to say, so I'm going to call it quits there. Um, if I think of anything more that I wish I'd said, I'll add it to the comments. This is already a very long video, and I doubt anyone's watched this far. But if you have, congratulations. Uh, I feel like there should be a trophy. Hopefully that all made sense. Sorry it wasn't better scripted, um, but I'll hope to, after Christmas is over, come back to some of the topics I've touched on in the run up to it, but not done as well as I want, and I'll do them a bit better. And uh, I suspect this will be one of them. <laughs>